Hi, I'm Charlie O'Massey and I'm here on the California Delta. I just won the Costa Series event and I'm going to take a few minutes of your time to show you exactly how I did it. Alright, let me explain to you what I was targeting during this tournament. This is a perfect spawning bay that I started every morning at in Frank's track. Why it's so good is it's got a mixture of exactly what I've been looking for, which is sparse tulies, it's got primrose growing off the bank, and then if you look into the water, it's got a bunch of sparse hydrilla clumps. The largemouth spawned in this cove about two weeks ago and now they're done, but all the bluegill are now taking their places on these beds and they're spawning in all these pockets in between these sparse uh, hydrilla clumps. So the key was waiting for the tide to drop out because what happens is when the tide drops out, the big fish that are hiding under this primrose on the bank start pulling out. When they start pulling out to deeper water, that's when they do their feeding and they take advantage of the bluegills that are spawning. So all my baits were bluegill imitators. Um, I had three primarily. Uh, the chatterbait I used in windy conditions like this. And then when it was calm, I used a swim jig. And then in areas uh, that I ran south in that were clearer, uh, that weren't as windblown and dirtied up, uh, from the wave action, I would throw the uh, ABT uh, bluegill glide bait. So uh, this was a key spot for me. Uh, my AM the first day caught a six here. I caught a couple fives here. And it was all about waiting for that tide to drop out, uh, for the fish to pull out of that primrose right there. And uh, then I'd throw the, either the chatter bait or the uh, swim jig through these sparse hydrilla clumps. Target every corner of each of these key hydrilla patches that you can because sometimes I had to make multiple casts to finally get them to react because there's a lot of, been a lot of pressure in this area. So uh, sometimes one cast won't do it. And uh, also if I really knew there was a sweet stretch, I'd go back through then with the swim jig, which is a little more subtle. And uh, that might trigger one more bite than most guys were getting in this area because this area was getting pounded. The key was waiting, waiting, waiting for the end of the outgoing. Another, uh, another secret I don't like to give up, but I will is, um, you know, a lot of this uh, weeds in the Delta, some of it has uh, what we call like angel hair or little, uh, little thready little weeds on it. I actually put a uh, punch stop on the front of it. You know, when you cut off your line tie, you've got that little tag in, and that thing usually catches all those stringy weeds. But when you use the bobber stop and just cinch it down over that knot, it basically comes through the weeds and doesn't catch hardly anything. So I felt like I could make more casts, multiple casts, more casts, because I wasn't spending as much time cleaning the weeds off my bait. So after I was finished with the Frank's track area, and the tide was too low, I'd start running south, which is really up the river here. Um, and on the way, I would try and find more areas similar to where I started. And this is one of them. You see the primrose growing off the bank? That's, a, that's the spawning flat right there because it's somewhat uh, east facing. So it's more protected from the wind than this side. And it has a nice pocket in the back where a lot of the fish that had pulled off from bedding were uh, taking advantage of the wind blowing in. And again, I'd only target the last third of the outgoing in all my areas. And it, depending on the water clarity or the wind, that would, choose, that would help me decide what bait to throw. It was a combination of the chatter bait and the really windy, dirty stuff, the swim jig in the kind of semi-calm stain stuff, and then the glide bait in the really clear, calm stuff. And it's all about getting your bait to fool the fish. So the clearer the water, the smarter they are. So the bluegill glide bait really made the difference there because they could take their time to decide whether they want to eat it or not. This is the new ABT uh, Glide Bluegill. It's got that new, um, what they call photo wrap finish on it. Basically, they take a picture of a bluegill and somehow make a uh, print out of it and you can stick it, right, overlay it right on top of the bait. In calmer, cleaner conditions, 
uh, reaction baits like the chatter bait or even the swim jig just weren't realistic enough. So these big fish are smart and they want something that's super lifelike. This is a spawning bank. There's isolated clumps of hydrilla out in front of it. And where the big fish would be laying is right in these corners to the right or left of the primrose patch. I'd cast the bluegill up into those corners, let it fall for just a second or two, and then twitch, twitch, twitch with my reel handle to make it mimic a bluegill trying to get away. And the big fish would come out of those corners and just hammer the bait. So here's a perfect example of uh, what I'm talking about with lanes and sparse tule clumps. You know, the tide is low and you see your hydrilla here, but you see your lane created right here between the backside of the hydrilla and the pennywort and sparse tules. That's a perfect ambush spot for these big fish when they move out from underneath that primrose. So what I would do again, just keep working those lanes, those sparse tule and sparse hydrilla patches with one of those three baits. Windy and dirty chatter bait. Windy and dirty with chatter bait. Pattern's still working, guys. So, you know, I appreciate you taking the time with me today to let me share some of these secrets that I've learned over the last 20 years on the Delta. So that hopefully when you come here, you can catch fish like these and big ones next time you're on the California Delta.